Hey folks, welcome to another edition of Garage Talk Plaza. Today is Thursday, I think it's March 9th, and we come to you with a heavy heart today because of the passing of our good friend Robert DeBleek, a.k.a. Bobby Bosch, a.k.a. The Chief. Now, as you all know, The Chief's been very sick for a long, long time, so this was a blessing that he got released yesterday. Um, Eddie called me and the connection didn't go through that well, but I knew damn well what was going on. I had called Eddie, or Eddie the day before, and he told me that he didn't think he was going to make it that night, and that was yesterday, and poor Bob didn't make it through the afternoon. Eddie left uh, the room, and um, Bob passed. So, uh, Bob was a great man, one of my best friends ever, um, and I cannot leave you without everybody has to remember the stuff in their own ways but god damn this guy gave me a lot of laughs and I think I did the same for him so we met I believe in the 80s at Mercedes two misfits one extremely fat one extremely bald so we immediately gravitated to one another um he was a uh, he worked for Robert Bosch, a very maligned company at the time, much along the lines of Joseph Lucas, virtual no starts, um, no fuel delivery, complete darkness and no starts, one drop of rain, moisture, anything else, a Robert Bosch product was known to fail miserably, miserably, I mean just their failure rate was absolutely horrible, a Robert Bosch specification for a proper alternator output B would be somewhere between 8 volts to 40. That's how their window was. Uh, they made such fantastic products. But Robert, Bob Watt worked for them. And um, he was the only guy, let me adjust this maybe a little more, the only guy that worked for Bosch that Kurt ever liked. And Kurt did not just like this guy. You could not love him. You couldn't. It was just, it just, his whole personality, you know, the lip. Yeah. What's up? And so, I got to know him. You know, one thing led to another, and we uh, we got to know each other really, really well. And we would go on adventures. And um, so, I think one of the first ones that happened was we decided to go to Florida together. Well, actually, he decided to go to Florida together. I was perfectly happy going by myself. And um, so he comes in one day and goes, hmm, uh, what's up? I got an idea. I'm like, I knew it was coming. He said, you're going to Florida. I said, yeah. I said, but, and this I had to preface this because his uncle drove everywhere his uncle ever went. He'd go from Nome, Alaska, uh, to like Cuba and not stop and Bob was the same way he was determined to follow in his uncle's footsteps so he's like I, 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 I said Bob I'm not going straight through I said I'm leaving at 8 o'clock Saturday morning and I'm stopping Saturday night sometime and if you want to do that that's fine with me if not, if not you go by yourself no, 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 I'll do that, I'll do that. So he had the furnace at the time, this gigantic diesel contraption that he bought. Uh, he gave it to Rob, and how she drove this battleship around, I don't know. How she even put up with the guy, I don't, we, we still don't know. Both people saints in my book. Um, so we, we're in Patterson having coffee Saturday morning, and he goes, I got, and he's, all melancholy looking in his coffee cup and his head's down and it's winter and it's shitty out and we're at the 10th Avenue Circle having coffee at some greasy spoon and he goes, I got something to ask you but I know the answer. I said, Bob, I'm not driving straight through. I know it. I know you. So, so we drive, we get on whatever the hell you get on, a turnpike or something, 95, blah, blah, blah. We're running and running and running. It's like we're in Georgia and it's now the temperature's changed the whole mindset is good because it's warmer out. It's going from what it was in Jersey. It was probably 30 in late February, early March. So in Georgia, it's like 60, which, you know, feels so much. It's, you're alive again. I blink my lights and uh, he goes, what? 
I said, I'm pulling already. It's eight o'clock, Bob. I'm stopping. And we're in Georgia. So immediately the lift goes. You can do what you want. Oh, okay. So we pull over, get a motel room. I tell him I'm going to take a shower. So he lays on the bed, right? So I take a shower and he's out. I mean, he's completely out. So I take his shoes off. And I go out and I figure I'll get some beer and some potato chips and stuff. And I come back in the room. He's still out, right? So uh, he never even had any beer or potato chips. I watched a movie and, you know, called it a night and went back to bed. Next morning I get up. He's still out. He's out there. <laughs> so I go in, you know, um, take a shower, get cleaned up, get ready to roll again. So I figured I better wake this guy up, you know, to do the three three S's for the day. And he goes, it's morning already? I said, yeah, what do you mean? He goes, oh, well, the reason I, I didn't want to go straight through, you know, without stopping is he goes, I don't sleep good on the road. I'm like, <laughs> doesn't sleep good. This guy's fucking out, right? So now he's, he goes, now he's mad that we stopped, Okay. So he pulls out of the motel 100 miles an hour, leaves me in all this diesel fumes. You know, nobody can see. He killed 4,000 mosquitoes. So he goes, I, I don't know what he's doing. So well, I'm on 95, and I see this guy on the side of the road with the flashers on and the pickup truck, and it's him going like this, right? Well, first of all, you see a guy that size on the side of 95 going, he doesn't have to do this. It's just a fat guy. You can't miss him, right? So he he sticks his head in the window and goes, I ain't going. I said, okay. Oh, you're mad now, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not mad. He goes, I'm going to Daytona. I want to see bikes. I said, Bob, that's fine. I want to smell perfume and see girls, right? So, so again, he speeds away. I didn't. Never saw him after that for the whole trip. Get back, finds out he gets arrested. <laughs> gets arrested in Daytona. He's taking, you know, a big photo buff and everything. So he's taking photos, and he wanders on the Daytona, the Daytona racetrack. He puts one foot on it, and they arrest the guy. I mean, he, you know, innocent as a puppy, this guy. He really was. So I guess they held him for like four hours and realized that, oh, this poor bastard's lost, and they let him go. So, oh, and so that was just one. And... um one of the others that comes to mind, and there are many, so you can you can turn this off if you want, because this is a tribute. This this guy was one of my best friends ever. You know those people you can count on on your one hand in the middle of the night, you call them up at two in the morning, it's 110 below zero, it's snowing like a motherfucker, and your car doesn't run, and there's any fees running. He's going to be the guy that comes and gets you. He is going to be the guy that comes and gets you. And there's not many people in your life that you can say that about. So, he moves into a house in er Erskine Lakes. It, they were basically summer houses converted. And it was his first house, so he's all proud of it and everything. And we all were. I mean, he... This guy worked for everything he got, folks. He worked for everything that he got. Um, he really did. There was no free handouts for him. He He really worked. I mean... If we could do anything for him, we did. And um, so he says that he needs a ball joint in Robin's car. And he shed a Dodge Dart. Chief, can you come up and help me put ball joints in Robin's Yeah, okay. So he got to Erskine Lakes, and there's Robin's car in the, in the driveway. And I looked, and he's not around. Where the hell is he? So um, I look in the car, and there's a box of ball joints. And it has this sticky note on it. Uh, went to the beach, thanks. I'm like, so I'm going to put the ball joints? I mean, it's no big deal. I think you'd do anything for this guy, you know? I mean, Bill, can you help me in Cube? I'm right behind you, buddy. So I go up to the beach, and I do say he did have a gift to gab with the ladies. He really did. So I see a bunch of women hanging around, and they're all you know, housewives with the kids and everything. And I said, well, who's this guy they're hanging out with? And it's him, and he's holding court up there, you know. The... 
to bathing suit. He had no ass. We called him no dumper because his ass fell off in the war or something. We don't know what happened. I think some of the um, North Vietnamese unscrewed his navel and they this baby just fell off on the ground. So he's there in his pants. He always had carpenter crackers. The, the trunks were always half down his ass. So I go, what are you doing? He's like, well, you know, m- m- you can do it. I'm up here. <laughs> Uh, I said, what are, what are all these women? Mm, they like... I said, no, they don't. They're looking for shade. Come on, let's go. So we, we put the ball joints in. So another another story about the house is that he bought this house and there was a whole lot of trees around it, really, really big trees. And he had worried about... Let me just get a cup of joe here. He had worried about these trees falling down on the house, rightfully so, too. So he says to me, could you help me cut some trees down? They were pretty good-sized trees, folks. I mean, these were not just, you know, 20, 30-foot trees. These were like 40, 50, maybe even 60-foot trees. I said, yeah, I'll try. I said, but I don't know the first thing about doing this. Oh, you got to help. You got to help. So I said, okay. So I was working with Paul at the time, and Paul was a real uh, nature person. He could hunt, fish, shoot, you know, all that stuff. So he was big into archery. So I don't know. I got this plan in my head. I said, let's try it. So me and Paul go over there one night after work. And I go, Paul, I said, you think you could put an arrow to the tippy top of that tree with a string on it? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So... We put a string on it, you know, like a cord, a pretty heavy cord. He shoots an arrow up to the tree. The arrow comes down on the other side. He shoots over the tree. So we loop the the arrow around, and then we hook a bigger cord onto the string and then a, a rope onto that one. So now we got something to pull on the, the trees to get them down. Robin immediately takes, the kids were younger. The, Robin immediately takes the kids out of the house and shovels them off to her mother-in-law's house. The guy, the neighbor guy, moves the Harlem Davidson out of the shed because everybody, really nice people, but everybody knew this was, this was a, a recipe for disaster. So Paul and Bob, because of Bob's extreme weight, held the cord, you know, the rope on the tree on the angle while I notched it. I knew a little bit about it, notch it, but I mean, this it could have went extremely bad. And so they pulled on the tree... I would cut the tree down, and they'd pull the tree down to where we wanted it to, f- to fall. And we cut down a number of them that day, and knock on wood, we had really good luck. So now we're cutting them into logs, cutting the limbs off them for kindling, cutting the logs up so it'll fit in this fireplace. And I'm, you know, you got the buzzsaw going, um, I can't hear anything, and I got the, the tree on a log saw horses and I'm feeding the thing in there and you know these guys are walking you know around it's it's winter time it's cold out it's getting to be the end of the day and every time I'm the chainsaw runs out of gas I'm like where the hell's the gas so the gas is on the other side of the yard so it runs out again gas so this happens like three or four times and I'm like chief why are you moving the gas all the way to the other side well, you're using all my gas. <laughs> I'm cutting all your dang logs up. Oh my golly! Oh, that was that was just one of the many ones. And um, oh, he was just, and he loved my father and him loved 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 one another. He'd come over to the house, and my father would be like. Hey, it's my old buddy, Bob, 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 Bob. My father could never pronounce or remember a soul's name. He barely remembered my name, right? You know? And so, but anyway, they hit it off, they hit it off famously. And um, me and Bob, through the years, just became closer and closer and closer. And I also became very close with Edward, Holly, and um, Bob's father, Mr. Dobleek, Edward, um, but um, we would go to, <laughs> Bob had no filter, folks. Bob had just no filter. He Lung tongue, I mean, um, he was just, and he gets something in his head, 
and it would just it would be locked in there. So we work with this guy, the Ripper. Now the Ripper folks, anybody that worked at Mercedes knew the Ripper. The Ripper was um he was an alright guy. He was just extremely, extremely nervous and jerky. So he bought a house like we all did. A lot of people in the beginning when you were bought a house, you bought a house in that Oakland floodplain. And um it's basically a shit area, but it was a foothold in Bergen County. And the Ripper had a quirk to him that um, the uglier and fatter the women were, the more he liked them. So he ended up dating linebackers for the Green Bay Packers generally, you know. And uh, we're like, you know, what are you doing, man? So he got this house in, in the floodplain in Oakland, and he finds out that he's got infested with termites. So he goes under the crawl space, and there's all this wood and everything that, the guy, some all previous owners left some stuff in there, and the termites were coming like there's no tomorrow. So he tells Bob that big mistake, and Bob comes up to me later that afternoon and says, "What are you doing tonight? What are you doing?" Tonight? I said, "Well, you know, at that time I was working pretty steadily on the side, going to people's houses and fixing cars." And he goes, "Can you come up tonight? Can you come tonight?" I'm like, "Well, no, I I got stuff to do. I can't really." Make so he goes on a campaign, come on, come on, you gotta help me clean out the under, you know, the um, crawl space in the house. And I sympathize with him because he couldn't fit under it. You know, he wouldn't fit under the crawl space door. So up I go, it's stinking dirty, it's hot. and There's poor Rob in there, you know, and I'm hum humping the stuff out. And she's like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, uh, so I start humping all this stuff from way back in the crawl space, and you can't see it. It's just spider webs and shit and dirt and hot, sweaty, everything sticking to you. So I start humping this really heavy bags of shit out, and I get out to where she's standing, and I'm like, Robin, this is this is frozen, you know, dried up concrete. Termites don't eat. I know, I know. Just get it out. Just get it out. We, we got it out, you know, and it's like, one of those things you just, you just, you went with the flow because it was just too funny. And, um, he get, he would get stuff in his head and, um, he, one night I'm out in the parking lot, I'm ready to leave and I, he, he had drove these Hondas, like these straight, these four cylinders, four cylinder Hondas in those days, really nice bikes. And I hear him go to start it and usually they start it right up, you know. I hear him go to start. So now he's looking at me, the helmet's on, and I could tell by his body language that he is fucking mad. You know, I could see through the helmet that the lip was, the legs were going backwards because that's how his knees went backwards when he got mad at something. He gets, finally gets the thing started, rubs the shit out of it, and drives at me at 100 miles an hour. Just misses me, and as he passes me, don't fuck with the bikes. Oh, all right. I knew that. I never would do anything to the motorcycle. I knew that was off limits. So I didn't know what was going on. Next day, he comes into work, and he's got the bike again. And hey, Bob, how you doing? I forgot about it. Um, sorry. So, what? What about? Um, I thought you switched the plug wires on the bike last night. I just. I use too much choke. <laughs> Forget about it, will you? Forget about it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he would <laughs> he would wait till the last minute to do stuff. Gonna move out of Clifton, you know the well. Bob Bosch moves the family out of Clifton. <laughs> like the Beverly Hillbillies. <sighs> Relatives said, Bob Bosch, move away from there. King of folks said, Vernon is the place you ought to be, so he let up the family and he moved to Vernon, New Jersey. Then he waits last minute Sunday. She goes around Sunday morning, 8 o'clock. Chief, can you help me get a truck? I got to move today. I said, you know, you didn't, no, no, and they're all out. That Nobody has a truck. Today. Yeah, because it's the weekend. They don't have any to rent on the weekend because everybody reserves them during the week. So poor Richie. Richie was this guy that, heart of gold, another guy, heart of gold, that had a 
this guy we knew from Hackensack, he was the main renter of the shop that we all together chipped in. And he gave us the full use of his machine shop, and we just made sure that his vehicles and my friend Bart's vehicles were running. Um, and Richie was just, I you can't say enough about him. And Richie had told me that he had a steak truck, a dually steak truck, that he goes, if you ever need it, keys are here, don't ask, just come and take it. So Bob comes in, crying the blues, and he's going to move that day from Clifton to Vernon with no vehicle. Oh, can you get me a truck? Can you get me a truck? So I'm like, yeah. I said, I can get Richie's truck. So anyway, we get Richie's truck. We made a couple of runs up and down. And so at the end of the day, I'm like, Bob, we got to stop at a liquor store. What for? I said, well, we used this guy's truck all day, and we did fill it up with gas, but I, <coughs> Richie liked to drink scotch, so I said, we got to get him that blue velvet scotch thing, which is expensive. In those days, it was like 25 bucks. Oh, we got to do that? I'm like, yeah, that's the least we can do. So I dropped the truck off that Sunday night. I write a note to Richie. I said, we're in Sunday. We used the truck. Here's the least we could do. Here's a, you know, a bottle of scotch. So next Saturday I went in, you know, in the morning he'd be in there. And I go, did you get my note? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the kind of guy Richie was. I go, did you like the scotch? He goes, oh, no, I donated it to the raffle sale at the church. Another good guy, right? So sometimes, not at sometimes, if you do it right, it all works out. If you just keep paying it forward. Just keep paying it forward, paying it forward. And that's what, that's what Bob did. And, um, occasionally there will be a, a stumble. Um, but with him, it was just, and everybody just, <laughs> it's the chief, you know? So we go to Slater's. There's this really cool go-go joint in, in, um, oh, up by his house in Wanaki somewhere. And it was a really cool one. It was, the girls were pretty. They would wear bikinis, um, and one of the or one of the girls was there was a medical student putting her way through medical school dancing, and she was really cute. Most of the girls were all just homegrown girls from that area, really really cute, really pretty, and um, it was pretty wholesome. I mean, the bathing suit stayed on. Everybody, you know, slipped a dollar here and there, and so one night Bob goes in. And he falls head over heels in love with this dancer. I mean, just head over. And it's now it's like 11, 12 o'clock, and it's a Thursday night. We both got to get up the next day. Oh, Bob, we got to go. No, I don't. I said, come on, we got to go. We got to get home, right? So I went to work the next day. Next day's Friday. Had a good time. Oh, yeah, you know, she was really something, blah, blah. And that's how he was. He, Nothing at Bosch mattered. Nothing at Mercedes mattered. All I was talk about was this girl at Slater. So, weekend comes. I don't see him that weekend. So, he comes in Monday. I go, hey, man, how you doing? You have a good weekend? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what'd you do? Oh, well, you know, I took Robin out to dinner. I said, oh, really? You know, that's pretty rare for him. You know, the kids were still young. I figured he took her to Steak and Ale. Was, I think it was a Steak and Ale up by his house and... I said, where'd you take her? He's like, oh, I'm... I'm like, you took her, where'd you go? Where'd you take her? Oh, Saturday, Saturday night. Oh, okay, you know, date night and everything. So I said, uh, where'd you end up taking her? I'm like, where? <laughs> he ended up taking his wife to Slater's Mill, a go-go joint, on Saturday night. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up. You just, you couldn't. And I mean, I could not spend 15 seconds with this guy without laughing my fucking ass off. He just, his whole view on everything was funny. His outtake on everything was just really, really unique, really, really funny, really, really new, naive, but also really, really wholesome. Um... I got to tell you one that Robin was so proud of him. I mean, her chest just swelled when he did this. And I got to say, he did his homework on this. And when this guy did his homework, folks, he did his homework. He wanted, he bought his 
father's house, the two-family house in Wanakew from his father. I guess it got left to him or something. So he was living upstairs originally, and his mother and father were living downstairs. Well, I think what happened was, oh, yeah, I think he ended up renting it to somebody upstairs, and they lived downstairs, which was just like a regular house, three-bedroom downstairs house, and I think it was a one, one apartment with a kitchen upstairs, but he wanted them to make a family room in the basement. And then he wanted to take out the lolly columns in the basement so he didn't have anything holding it up, you know, to support so he could have the whole area open. So he went to a fabricator up there in Wanakew and told the guy, you know, how big the house was, the square footage of the house, how high, blah, blah. So they get an architect in there and a fabricator and they devised I guess like an eight, 10 inch high beam that was the width of the house that would support the entire weight of the house and get, get the lollies out. So he really did his homework on this folks. He, he gets the screw jacks. Um, I guess he got five, six of them and he did it. He listened to the guy, the fabricator and the architect told him screw it half a turn a night for like two weeks or three weeks. So he turned each one half a turn a night, lifting the house up little increments, little, little increments, right? So the fa the beam comes, and the beam was like the w the length of the driveway. It was the width of the house, but the house was, you know, it was a pretty wide house, and the driveway was kind of short, so it took up the whole driveway. So what he was going to do is he was going to set this the I-beam on the sills, build up the sills with concrete, so the sills were like this a little bit. He was going to make them level and set the I-beam on the sills, and then screw the, the jacks. So kids, he did his homework on this. He got a whole bunch of us, the gorilla, I pray, Jose, uh, me, I don't know, a bunch of guys, like 10 guys. And he cooked the barbecue for us. And so it was five guys outside, five guys in the basement. So the five guys inside fed the five guys in the basement, the beam, the beam was heavy dudes. The beam was really, really heavy. And so the five guys in the basement, we humped it in until we got it in enough. And then the five guys on the outside put it into place on the sill. And that was it. That's all, you know, we had to do that day. So he cooked up burgers. And then for the next two or three weeks, he just unscrewed the, the screw jacks in the house, came down onto the beam and he finished the basement. He, did a really good job. Um, you know, you have one, two friends in your life that you can count on. And um, I've been blessed to have more than that. I've had more really good friends that I could count on that were true blue. Bob Dubleek, Bob Bosch, the chief, was one of them, folks. I cannot say enough about this guy. Um, I mourned heavily for him last night. Le yesterday was not a good day. A lot of shit happened, and then I found out that Bob had passed. So I want all you that watch this to remember him as he was. The kind, kind, kind man that he was. The giving person that he was. Um, didn't have a selfish bone in his body. He would do anything for anybody. He was one of my true, true good friends. I, I've been blessed, blessed by the Lord to know this man. I hope he's at peace, and I do hope that he's with his uncle now, Johnny, um, who everybody at Mercedes learned everything they know, whether they want to admit it or not, from John Brazell. So I hope you enjoyed this eulogy, kids. I'm usually not good at this. But I would like some feedback on this. Just send me a text. I don't know how this <clears throat> comment things works. But send me a text. Let me know what you think. Um, remember Bob in your hearts today. Say a prayer if you think of it. If you're of that ilk. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. Again, please like, sub subscribe. Especially to this one. Because this one goes right here for me. And... Um, I could go on and on and on, but <laughs> this is, he. all I can say is I love you, Bob. I'm happy you're in a better place. Talk to you. I'll see you soon, my dear friend. I'll see you soon.